Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're going to be talking about Alexander the Great, or as our 10 year old would say, echoing, I think, YouTube comments, probably. <laughs> Alexander the not so great, Alexander the mer- merely middling. <laughs> it's a whole series of, of epithets for him. But we're not doing it alone. We're going to be talking to Meg Finlayson, whose work is, at least in part, about Alexander, but in particular about the reception of Alexander the Great. So we're going to talk about Alexander through the ages and how people have thought about him. So welcome, Meg. Thank you very much for having me. So why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and why you're interested in Alexander the Great to start us off? Sure. So I'm a recent graduate in classics. I just completed my MLit at the University of St. Andrews in classics. And prior to that, I worked on an MSc and a BA ONS at the Edinburgh, at University of Edinburgh and University of Winchester, respectively. So I've been studying classics throughout my um, university career and for a little bit during my um, school time. But I kind of fell into classics a little bit accidentally, really. When I was in school, when I was about 15, 16, what I really wanted to study was Russian literature and Russian history. (laughs) Kind of, you know, War and Peace, Dostoevsky. I was a bit of a, I was a very bookish kid. So I just kind of grabbed the biggest book that I could find, War and Peace, and thought, yeah, this is going to be it. (laughs) Um, So that was my original plan. But then when it came to choosing subjects in school, I went to school in the UK. You sort of choose different subjects that you're limited to do for the last kind of couple years at school and the Mm. one that I wanted to do which wasn't actually history it was Spanish funnily enough (laughs) kind of bizarre (laughs) I couldn't do because of a timetabling issue so they kind of sat me down and said really sorry we can't make it work just pick something else and I kind Mm. of hummed an art about it and I thought well what is the closest thing to history and like English literature that you've got and they were like oh well the guy who teaches history also teaches classics and I was like okay what's that they were like oh you know (laughs) kind of history it's like ancient history So I knew a little bit about it. My school had taught us Latin for one year until the Latin teacher retired. (laughs) It was kind of (laughs) keep her on the books, I think, just to get her to the pension age. So I kind of briefly knew about it. So I kind of said, yeah, okay, that'll do. And then we picked up Arian's Anabasis and a bit of Plutarch and started learning about Alexander the Great and his life and his campaigns for one of those modules. And from that moment on, that was that was kind of it for me. It kind of sealed my fate. <laughs> and then I almost applied for university to do English literature because that had been going alongside it as well. But then, mm-hmm. you know, as, as fate would have it, I kind of didn't get the university that I wanted to do English at. And I thought, you know what, actually, I'm going to go back to classics since that's worked out well for me. <laughs> so by that point, yeah, the deal was was really sealed. So it was a bit of a reluctant kind of accidental tumble into it, but <laughs> but here we are. <laughs> so I, you know, started with with studying it and reading some of the original texts about Alexander's life. And I just thought, my God, this guy's fascinating. He's horrible, mm-hmm. he's awful, but he's also kind <laughs> of very, very interesting. And I guess that mm-hmm. that interest is what has what has carried me through for the last <laughs> seven years. Yeah, I mean, you're not alone on that. I'd say that a lot of people have found him pretty fascinating over the years. And I think in part because we both have so many sources and such bad sources at the same time, which is, I think, the root of a lot of people's obsessions in classics on the the things we have a lot of sources, but not perfect sources on. Yeah, it's very interesting to kind of peel back the different different layers and find stuff. That's always, I think, uh, what the classicists love to do. And ancient historians, archaeologists mm-hmm. just love to go for the bit with a bit of intrigue. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Where there are questions where you know that none of you are ever going to actually figure out the answers mm-hmm. to some fairly major questions. But there's so many things to discuss in not coming to those conclusions. <laughs> and, and so so many of those things, I guess, kind of accrued in the story like right at the beginning, mm-hmm. right? He he becomes sort of legendary while he's still alive. I think I read somewhere a, a quote of one of his generals, you know, seeing something about some made up love affair in one of the stories. And he says, I wonder where I was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely a legend, you know, a legend in his own time, mm-hmm. as opposed to so many people. I mean, that's a good place to start, actually. Just, I'm sure nobody listening doesn't know who Alexander the Great is. <laughs> But 
you know, do you want to just give us some really, really basic facts about time, place, lifespan, you know, what, what do we know? And I don't mean tell us the life story, life story of Alexander the Great, because that's other people do those podcasts better than us. But yeah, just some basic <laughs> we'll, we'll <laughs> situate be, us in time. We'll be here till 2022 if that was. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, to, to situate him in, in his time frame, I think it's always interesting to consider when he was around. I think when a lot of people, mm-hmm. if you pick someone off the street and say, oh, give me an example of like ancient Greece. I think one of the first things they think of is kind of this idea of oh the Parthenon Socrates running around you know the Acropolis Mm -hmm. and fighting the Persians that's kind of where people tend to gravitate towards it's what we see on screen Mm -hmm. it's what we see you know covered a lot in books in traditional education Uh, they go towards like the fifth century and the thing that about Alexander is he he's timeless and not because the way that his story has become mythologized and imbued with all these additional elements he almost reads like he could be this tale from almost the Homeric times and that's sort of a very deliberate facet that I you know hope we'll talk about a little bit later but he wasn't really he was came around in the mid fourth century so he was born in 356 BCE he was the son of Philip II who was king of Macedon, which rose really to prominence (laughs) under his father's reign. So a lot of the information about Alexander now, a lot of it is kind of focused on what their achievements were in tandem. I think we've kind of overshadowed a lot of Macedonian history based on, you know, the trials and tribulations of Alexander, but it's good to put him into the context of he was the son of also somebody who was very illustrious, who was very um, successful. And he kind of came into this world really sort of primed to do good things. He would have had to be, Mm -hmm. you know, a very lazy person to not do anything good because he had all of these things kind of put in front of him. A lot of the army innovations, a lot of the wealth was all accrued by his father. So what Alexander's best known for is his campaign against the Persian Empire, his defeat of the Persian Empire, and then his subsequent travels further east. So he began his campaigns very young, which is another part of, I guess, the excitement Mm -hmm. and the allure of this character is that he was only 20 years old when his father was assassinated and he took over as king. And the majority of this campaigning was done in his early 20s. You know, he spent the ages of Mm -hmm. 21 to 26, you know, stomping around the ancient Mediterranean, you know, killing people and stealing things. (laughs) <laughs> so, you know, very young age, it puts, you know, if, if you consider that to be a benchmark of achievement, I think we all kind of are underachievers by comparison. <laughs> There's uh, several, there are yeah. several stories, aren't there, of, of classical, later classical figures doing the, I mean, the fav- the one I know is Julius Caesar standing and looking at a monument and being like, by this age, Alexander was already dead or whatever, mm. by, by his age, you know, <laughs> and, and thinking, I haven't achieved anything. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, but by far the best thing I guess that Alexander did in terms of his his PR management was was to die. Really, mm-hmm. <laughs> he died uh, in his early thirties, I believe, at the age of thirty two, just shy of thirty three, of this kind of sudden illness. There's you know several conspiracies onto whether he was poisoned, but it's mm-hmm. we'll just know it was a very short and sudden death. And he kind of left everything very open ended because he was in the middle of planning to do all these other things and hadn't really solidified much. So that's one, I guess, the downsides if you could criticize him as a general and a leader is, aside from all the murdering and <laughs> stealing, is <laughs> he didn't really do much of the consolidation. And that's why, you know, inevitably after his death, it's what ushers in the Hellenistic age of these big kingdoms that were once of this kind of theoretical empire that was never quite brought to life because he died before he could manage that step but you know he dies very young everything is left so open-ended and in this power vacuum is where you get a number of the very prominent personalities of the Hellenistic age the Seleucid kingdom Mm -hmm. the Ptolemies who would have you know successful mini empires and successful um, kingdoms of their own in the wake of that but it's also it's also very um, helpful for his image because now he's he's Mm -hmm. died at I guess the height and the pinnacle of achievement there was no fall from fall from grace really he just mm-hmm. kind of died at the very top of it and it's in that kind of very quick death it's a very high quick turnover of him becoming this you know mythologized exaggerated figure and being manipulated by the people that came after him to best suit their purposes as they kind of go on in their own ambitious endeavors mm-hmm. i think the i think it also really matters that he died i mean <laughs> this could sound really trivial but he died pretty 
You know, he died still pretty. And I think when you look at the reception of him later, I think the fact that he was good look, you know, at least reputed to be good looking and he was still young and basically fit is actually a big part too of of why he's continued to have such a, you know, when you think about the the ancient emphasis on on looks and youth and beauty and also the modern one, I think that's a, a big part of it too. Had he had he lived to become old and weary and maybe not so good looking, I don't I think there would be difference to his legend. Yeah, definitely a lot of it is this kind of appeal and the charisma and, you know, his image was was extremely important and mm-hmm. extremely important to how he wanted to craft himself, but also to his later successes, because a lot of what we know of Alexander is kind of created after his death. We don't have any remaining posthumous, sorry, we don't have any remaining images of him that were created during his lifetime. There's a lot of the images right. that are immediately posthumous. And so it it's very difficult to kind of trace back what was his original appearance. What did he want? Because all these facets of his appearance are all very delicately and purposely crafted to suit a certain message. You know, we we can we can craft together like a little bit. We, we there are in Plutarch, he has a description of him. In Alien, I think in Curtius, he writes a bit about what he looks like. We know that he wasn't as tall as his other generals because there's a famous. Um, scene where after defeat in battle the Persian king Darius III left his wife and his children behind he had to kind of flee very quickly and leave the everything behind so Alexander got the treasury and he got the royal family so quids in really he was really <laughs> quite lucky on that day and then the the queen mother kind of comes to his ten and throws himself at the feet of who she presumes to be the great king because he's so tall and so handsome and starts begging, you know, please be nice to us. But it's not actually Alexander. It's his, you know, best friend, closest companion, mm-hmm. Christian, who was supposedly the taller and better looking of the two. So <laughs> we know that he was, you know, not even the best looking in his own camp, <laughs> but it does, that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, above his weight may be a little bit in that regards, but that's not really the important <laughs> fact. The important fact is that, well, but for all intents and purposes, he was charismatic. He was good looking. He had all these charismatic, traits even if you know what we can originally construct is mm, well you know maybe yeah. <laughs> even the best looking out of his own friends mm-hmm. there's a little bit of the uh, cleopatra there too right the same thing where what matters is the impact she had on other people not exactly what she looked like yeah absolutely and you know i think my my own thoughts on alexander aside i think it's always hard to construct who, what you think about him as a person because you don't know him as a person and i think i can say mm. with some confidence that he must have been a charismatic person Mm -hmm. because people did you know at least at the beginning want to follow him and want to believe that he would be the best person for the job even though you know that might be because they had a sword at their throat but (laughs) (laughs) they were still willing to kind of you you know use his image and use his name positively he didn't just get scrubbed out of the annals of history after 10 years as everybody else kind of fought for for dominance so there Mm -hmm. must be something in that legend and that mythos that was worth preserving Mm-hmm. And qu- quite a, fa- I, I don't know if it's quite famous, but one of my favorite anecdotes about um, the successors is that I believe it was Cassander who was one of his one of his generals. Slightly later in life, would see see a statue of Alexander that had been created and put up, and supposedly it was so so lifelike and brought back such memories that he started shivering and trembling at the sight of the statue of Alexander. And you think, my goodness, this man must have had such an impact. <laughs> you know, his friends look at a picture of him ten years later, and you know have a physical reaction you think well he must have been quite a person yeah (laughs) yeah one way or another I suspect being in his like being around him was you didn't forget I mean I think that's the that's the sort of overwhelming uh, impression you get from from the sources is that whatever else happened you you remembered that you'd been in contact with him (laughs) yeah absolutely okay so so he has this amazing life or at least an impressive life, like legend or no legend, the actual facts of what happened in, during his lifetime were pretty pretty good. I'll give him that, <laughs> my, my considered judgment. What do you focus on in your work? Like, is it the life of Alexander or the literary sort of impression of him? What What are the things that you're most interested in in, in the work you've done? So in some of the dissertations that I've written in, in, in recent years, my first kind of exploration into Alexander, my first piece of original research for my undergraduate dissertation is I looked at li- the literary portraits of Alexander the Great. So when you read these ancient histories, when you read, you know, Arian, Plutarch, Curtius, Diodorus, 
all of the all of the big hitters in Alexander historiography, it becomes so clear to you that what you're reading is it's not quite <laughs> not something not quite right. It's not quite adding up, but it's a very <laughs> vivid story. And it's such an interesting story that to me, I think how history is written is also a very important part of studying history alongside what happened. I can't quite put a moment on it, but I think the moment where I kind of had this shift in my in my studying, in my research, was the moment I kind of pointed out, it doesn't actually matter if what's happened is true or not, it's why is it written in that way? Mm. So one of the things that I looked at was the influence of, was on home of Homer and heroes on how Alexander's character was constructed, because that's really what we're, we're looking at, especially in, you know, these works that are written by, you know, first century. So looking at Curtius, Plutarch, and Arian, we're looking at a construction of a character as much as we are looking at a history of a person. And they're mm. always kind of fighting and you know going upstream when they're trying to construct these histories, really, because we're looking at something that's written four centuries after the man has died. It comes into existence in kind of this this new Roman um, Empire era. It's in, you know it's covered in all these other things. It's having to deal with these different battling literary traditions, and what comes out is less of a true history, is more than it is a kind of a reflection of what the Alexander myth stood at at that time, as much as it is mm-hmm. trying to capture a moment from history so I found it very interesting to look at the debt that was owed to the work of Homer which is especially apparent in in Arian's work so in the introduction to Arian's Anabasis which is his you know his main work on Alexander he has this brilliant line where he says you know he wants to be the Homer to you know Alexander's Achilles right so he wants to write this kind of epic you know, tale, it's it's not in it's not in a verse, it's in it's in prose, but he wants to write this epic tale to immortalize Alexander in the same way that Homer immortalized Achilles. A lot of the the way that it's constructed, a lot of the set pieces, some of the language used, you can almost see kind of that Homeric strand, you know, the descriptions of Alexander's armor while he's in battle is very, you know, he's got shining shields and, you know, it's all very, we don't quite have a full arming scene, but we almost get there. We're kind of the provenance of where he's picking up some of these weapons. And, Mm. uh, you know, with Plutarch's biography, it's, I think people give Plutarch a bit of a hard run. You know, everyone's kind of saying, you know, (laughs) don't take him with a grain of salt, take him with a massive, you know, you know, grit van (laughs) worth of salt. (laughs) Fair enough, but I do think that he puts forward what is a very interesting biography, and it takes a lot of its cues from, from almost uh, from almost Greek tragedy, really, because the story that he presents of Alexander is almost a tragedy. You know, he has he has these moments of madness where he's in a drunken rage and he kills his friends, and he has this very prestigious childhood with all these kind of you know moments of it's almost like a higher power is intervening in his life. He sees omens, he sees you know all sorts of things, which you know in in a deeply religious, deeply sort of superstitious Greek society, of course you know omens, religiosity was a part of Alexander's life and his campaigns, but it's definitely constructed in a way that makes you see that this is being put together as a coherent narrative and it's mm-hmm. it's a different thing for a historian to wrangle with because on the one hand it's very interesting you know it's a, it's a brilliant story that's the reason why these tales have survived but then you also kind of have to unpick it and think well why you know I'm not sure that Alexander did go and have dalliances with Amazon princesses I'm not quite <laughs> sure that did happen but you know why is that being included in Curtis's history well it's because he's making a statement about alexander as a figure he's you know a- emphasizing this heroic nature you know what why is alexander cur- crying out and cursing dionysus as he kills his best friend well maybe he didn't really see a vision of dionysus but perhaps the author's including it because we're meant to read this as a parable for you know the dangers of over excess we're supposed mm. to take something away from it so the alexander story is almost a vector for other things and that's kind of what I took away from the Alexander literature and that was kind of I guess the overall overarching theory behind that thesis when I was working in undergrad as well there's a lot more to these stories than just to dismiss them as oh well it's 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 Plutarch he's making things up or oh Arian's just trying to kind of write a good spin a good yarn in a sense those things are true but it doesn't kind of negate the more interesting and useful things underneath it which is it's a construction of how Alexander existed at that point in time which is all we kind of have to work with really. So why do you think Alexander then is such a 
a useful device for uh, authors to kind of reflect, you know, whatever their their particular you know issues in their time is. I think because he he does so much and he has such an overlap in so many different areas, there's a lot that you can you can map onto him. There's a lot of kind of cautionary tales that you can map onto. He almost exists as this paradigm of the good general. You know, when, when he's good, he's good, but when he's you know bad, he's absolutely terrible. So if you <laughs> want to use him as a <laughs> as you know a model of this is how you be a good soldier. You know, you read your Homer, you have a good physical education, you you know listen to your tutors, you come from a good strong family, and then you will do good strong things. You can kind of have that moral lesson through Alexander, you know, he, he read his Iliad, listened to his dad, loved his tutor, you know, did good <laughs> stuff. But then if you want to use him as kind of the, the, you know, this paradigm of, you know, the dangers of excess, it's like, well, you know, you don't drink too much because you'll end up, you know, killing your best friend, you know, don't have too many dalliances with, you know, exotic foreign people because you'll end up alienating your friends so there's kind of all these little moral lessons that can be tied up in him because he has such a varied career and did such unprecedented things. It's almost hard to find kind of a motif that you almost can't map onto Alexander's life and his and his travels because there's such a diverse breadth of of information available, even if you know not all of it is is reliable. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, that's you know that's kind of the impression that I get from the medieval reception of Alexander is, you know, there's sort of two Alexanders, which aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, but there's the, you know, the, the heroic explorer, adventurous Alexander. And then there's the Alexander as exemplum of pride. And, but you can do both <laughs> if you need to. Yeah, I think that there's a brilliant like first line of this article. It was one of the first articles I read about Alexander, and it was the article. I think it's Alexander the Good or Terrible. I'll have to <laughs> go back and find out who it, who it's by. And it kind of starts off, and its point is, you know, I think one of the reasons why Alexander has been so so popular, and you know, he, we exhume him time and time again, is that we can't decide whether he's the good guy or the bad guy. Mm -hmm. always kind of and that's you know a fairly simplistic way to look at it but at, at it's hard I think it's true because people do fluctuate between deciding you know good guy with the things he does you know justified were they okay was he really like this great you know person for spreading Hellenic culture and therefore that was worth all the bloodshed or is he you know this absolutely terrible awful tyrannical you know antichrist figure which he kind of appears I think it's perhaps there's some some discussion on whether he appears in the Quran as like a two-horned devil mm -hmm. right and so it's kind of but the thing is he is he's both at the same time and it's almost like well you can't reconcile those two sides together can you but I think it's you have to because they are both equally they come from a similar literary tradition it's just that he kind of fluctuates between these two poles Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's where I guess my interest in, in Alexander reception and the history of scholarship comes into as well, because the kind of Alexander that you're going to read about depends so heavily on when it was written and who it was written by. Because if you mm -hmm. look at influential biographies of Alexander from the early 20th century, so I think of W.W. W. Tarn, who wrote a lot on Alexander. And then if you look at some of the ones that were written a little bit later, sort of in the wake of, you know, post-World War II, post-Nazi you know Nazi fascism, they've got very different perspectives on what this figure mm -hmm. means you know tarn is is a british a british member of the gentry so he's very influenced by these ideas of british colonialism so with that in mind it's understandable why his version of alexander is this enlightened almost gentleman and a scholar you know he goes to india and he slaughters all these people but he also introduces them to hellenism so therefore it's not that bad and you can kind of see <laughs> Well, the British, you know, went into the British Raj and killed a load of Indians, but at least they gave them the railways. That's kind of <laughs> an argument you see banded around a lot. So you can see how those two pictures and portraits of Alexander go hand in hand. But mm. then in the rise of, you know, people seeing the the consequences of fascism in Europe in the in the mid you know the mid 20th century you then get this kind of rebuttal against Alexander's like well actually he's a bit of a totalitarian dictator he's he's horrible he's awful you know he's a, <laughs> it's you know absolutely just a violent you know crazed drunken megalomaniac behavior so mm -hmm. it's very interesting how again he's got so many different facets to his personality that are all both kind of 
you know, ridiculously opposite and yet still equally true, that the one that kind of rises to prominence so heavily depends on when and where our understanding is situated. Mm-hmm. When I, f- the very first year I was teaching as a, as an assistant prof, the first year I had to teach a course called the Hellenistic world. And I, I would just like to point out that I do Latin poetry. That's my topic. <laughs> so I was teaching this, you know, third year history course called the Hellenistic world from Alexander to Cleopatra. And it was, it was tough. <laughs> I didn't, I had never studied that at all. I had this textbook, we had a textbook and I just, you know, I took the textbook that had been used by the prof before me because I knew nothing about it. And I was always one chapter ahead of the students. That was the only way I got through that year. Yeah. But the textbook, I think it's, is it Francois Chamonou or something? He's, it's something like that. He's French. And the first chapter is, you know, does the, disposes of Alexander because the the textbook's really about the diadochi and every, everything that comes after it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the first chapter, it was just, it was nothing but Alexander the Great is an amazing man. Look at all the wonderful things he did and how he spread all of Hellenistic culture. And he is the best, the end. And everyone who says he isn't had like amazing translated from the French prose about everyone who thinks he isn't is a small embittered person with no understanding of the greatness of great men. And everyone who <laughs> criticizes Alexander just shows by that his own inability to understand greatness. I mean, like, this is my textbook. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not surprised because some of the things <laughs> that you will read about him, I think one, one of my personal favourites is to look at kind of social media mentions of Alexander, whether it's kind of an mm-hmm. OPD in, like, in history or something like that. And if they if they call him, like, Alexander the Third of Macedon as opposed <laughs> to Alexander the Great, you can bet in the comments there's going to be, like, a million Greeks going, you mean the Great, you mean he's Alexander the Great, he's the Great. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so, uh, it's so interesting that that kind of people get really ooh, they kind of really rise up and have this such strong opinions yeah but it you know i think part of that is just because he gets recast to mean so many different things and he gets well yes this new sense of of nationalism you know nowadays mm-hmm. and, you know, in in the late 90s onwards you know the macedonian question has become a very you know political hotbed <laughs> now mm-hmm. And it seems yeah. almost bizarre. I, I like kind of talk to people and they go, well, what, 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 what's new that's interesting about Alexander the Great? Why are you still talking about Alexander the Great, as people have said before? And I'd be like, do you know that like you can you can talk about Alexander the Great in the context of Eurovision? And they're yeah. like, what? what? And I'm like, well, you we can <laughs> because of the, the name changes of, you know, former Yugoslav mm-hmm. Republic of Macedonia wanted to call mm-hmm. themselves Macedonia and the Greeks blocked that and obviously there's more to that than just you know some guy who was around 2,300 years ago but the name of Alexander gets invoked in these arguments mm-hmm. it's still being used as kind of like a sort of a, a nail to hang points off even nowadays and I think oh yeah you know part of the enduring interest and why we should still be interested in Alexander the Great no matter how many biography get published every year i've read a depressing statistic it's like two or something <laughs> two, <laughs> two a year at least for the last god knows how long but i still think it's worth kind of looking at because you're you're not just looking at this man who was died at the age of 32 and traveled around you know 2000 years ago you're looking at how his his being and his essence and his mythos has been twisted and turned throughout you know centuries millennia and still finds ways to be relevant Mm-hmm. Well, and absolutely. I mean, I don't know that we need a biogra- more biographies of him, but we we need more history. Hist- I can't say the word historiographies of him is what we most. I mean, I I would say we need the most because the the Alexander the Great question, or the you know, in the same those things like all that stuff that was there in the early sources, but is so important now, you know, did he speak Greek or Macedonian? Are those the same or not? Is the culture he spread Greek or Macedonian? Are those the same or not? The The framing of those questions meant one thing in the ancient world and means something slightly different now, but, you know, is is actually a, an as you say, an ongoing vital political and cultural question right now that people care deeply about it. And so how you frame and how you think about it and how people have thought about Alexander has real world implications. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, th- I always think it's fascinating. When I, when I was in Edinburgh for my master's, I never saw this statue and I'm furious because I didn't even know it existed. And my friend who'd lived there for four years didn't tell me, never never crossed his mind. So I was so angry. But in Edinburgh, there, there's a statue of, of Alexander taming his war horse Bucephalus. Oh. 
Wow. And you think, my gosh, we're in like a capital of, of Scotland, which mm-hmm. is so far removed from, you know, ancient Greece and Macedonia. <laughs> and yet they have this massive statue of the young mm-hmm. Alexander taming Bucephalus. And you just think, you know, that the transfer of that that story and mm-hmm. what it, what it must have meant and what you know the the wider story it tells us about i don't know perseverance or you know strength or being mm-hmm. kind to your pet animals i don't know but the fact <laughs> that you know you have these things that are placed in different places that seem so far removed it's like well he must be an important figure for at least mm-hmm. how we what we take from the ancient world and how we apply it to ourselves for it to be, for him to be continually relevant to have statues put up in you know the capital of scotland <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we can get. We'll. I want to circle back to to modern reception later because I think there's some some other stuff to talk about for the ancient stuff. But your mention of Bucephalus reminds me that my first encounter with, you know, first inkling that there was such a thing as Alexander was th- through the story of Bucephalus in the the Black Stallion book, which I don't know if that is something that means anything to, especially to a non-American like someone not from North America. But there are a series of books and the movie. There was a movie about it that are about horse racing and it's there from the mid mid 20th century, the forties, fifties, but they were very, you know, everybody read them sort of thing like black beauty and the, and the black stallion are the two horse books as a horse obsessed young girl that I read. And in it, it starts off with the, the young boy who was horse mad being told a story by his uncle or father, his uncle of Bucephalus. And there's this little figure. And in the movie, they have him like imagining Bucephalus jumping out of the arena and all of that, the whole story. And then he goes on to meet a a wild Arabian stallion who he becomes best friends with. And story goes on from there. But like, that was my, you know, age seven, (laughs) I read this story about this horse. And that was my first encounter with Alexander. So it took me, it was a lot later that I found out who the heck Alexander was, <laughs> but I knew all about his horse. <laughs> I think it's what he would have wanted. He was very fond of his yeah. horse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was perfectly appropriate. <laughs> anyway, so you you looked into the literary reception. Is there anything you want to like specifically highlight about that or the artistic reconstructions of, of who Alexander was? Yeah, I mean, I kind of did that for, for undergrad and then I kind of moved forward with my studies and I wanted to look at, wanted to look at another aspect, another facet of, I guess, the construction of Alexander and something that I was very interested in just from a, you know, just from an aesthetic point of view is, is artwork and, you know, beautiful mm-hmm. sculptures and how do they, how do they look like that? They're so amazing. Wow. And I wanted to look at this image of Alexander because it is such a famous image it's one that if you kind of have an idea you can almost instantly recognize because the features are so sort of stylized that it becomes so obvious mm-hmm. who he is when, when you think of Alexander you think of you know the leonine hair you think of the anastole these are all such iconic features so very kind of long sort of curly hair the anastole is almost I guess you call it like a cowlick like this kind of bit that goes upwards from the forehead and then other, you know, particular calling cards is, you know, the slightly tilted neck, you know, the slightly parted lips. If you see a portrait from the ancient world, you can kind of really guess like, mm, I think that might be an Alexander because it's so, even if it comes from different places. So you look at, I think of the head that's in the British Museum where he's a little bit, a little bit dumpy. He's a little bit worn, <laughs> you know, he's a bit, um, <laughs> better days but you could still look at it and go yeah okay he's got like a strong chin these kind of full lips this kind of very sort of it's almost shaggy hair and then you see an mm-hmm. image you know I think of the the head that's in the Capitoline this kind of Alexander Helios is it Alexander is it supposed to be Helios is it kind of amalgamation of the two don't know but it's kind of got that title I think and you can see well I kind of do still see the resemblance because stylistically there's definitely a similarity so what I kind of looked at is a bit of what you know what, what do these Im- what, what does this image mean why is it why did it become this way it's obviously not a portrait he hasn't done you know the Cromwell paint me warts and all type thing where he wants to represent <laughs> exactly as he is no no th- this is a very deliberate kind of ch- decision a deliberate choice so definitely the impact that it had on what you know the visual language of kingship is so interesting because you know prior to this if you were depicting a king be it the king of the gods be it the king of sparta whoever is supposed to be in this regal you know agamemnon on the you know beautiful vases Mm -hmm. they're always depicted bearded Mm -hmm. quite an important 
facet of kingship is that you are a mature man you are you know powerful brave you probably have a beard right and even if you don't <laughs> want to look like you have a beard you know you think of it's it's a different culture but i kind of think of the pharaohs and hat set shirt and she had a had a fake beard and that was to mm-hmm. that she was a she was a pharaoh you know mm-hmm. It's very interesting then that Alexander kind of changes all that and the beard in terms of the visual language of kingship just disappears for, you know, centuries. It doesn't really come back till Hadrian. Mm -hmm. He only brought it back because he was a Hellenophile and he was looking to pre-Alexander or maybe because he had a weak chin, I'm not sure. (laughs) <laughs> you know it kind of, with beards it's always hard to tell yeah, <laughs> motivations <laughs> this clean shaven you know face and again i think it all comes down to how the best thing alexander ever did for his pr machine was to die because mm-hmm. as you mentioned he died a young man you know i don't know what age specifically that men were expected to start growing and maintaining their beards but you could think you know 20 year old alexander he's you know just out of his teens he's still a youth really by all accounts mm-hmm. i don't know how well he would have been able to grow and maintain a beard <laughs> so well uh, yeah i mean the, the way the if you think about the the ideological uh, approach to youth and age in the say classical greek period you have the sort of early 20s as when the beard is expected to start start probably coming in in a real way that's when you cease to be and a Phoebe, basically, right? That's and then and but even if you look to Rome later, an adolescentulus, like a young man, an adolescent, is up till his thirty. So, I do think there's that. Yeah, the the, the cutoff for full adulthood is definitely into your thirties, and I, I can't imagine. Yeah, it, it kind of comes with until then. this point where it's almost like the existing model of kingship just isn't suitable. So he needs mm-hmm. to find something else. And the something mm-hmm. else is he draws a lot of kind of his visual aspects of kingship from images of athletes and images of gods. Right. So to be clean shaven and to have long hair is one of these things where it's kind of a youthful attribute. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to be a youth in the mortal world is to kind of be perhaps inexperienced. You know, when he became king, there was all these, you know, attempted uprisings. So people thought, great, we've got a child on the throne pretty much. We can get, you know, the Macedonian yeah. of our backs. And of course, that didn't work out, but there must have been this assumed scoffing you could probably imagine around, you know, the debate halls in Athens. Oh, we'll be rid of those mm-hmm. Macedonians soon. There's, there's, you know, he's he's 20. Come on. So he has to look for this kind of new image of what would be appropriate that is both, you know, something powerful, but something that is his reality. So this drawing on these images of, of gods to make his hair, you know, to keep his hair mm-hmm. longer, to keep his face deliberately clean shaven. And part of the interesting aspect of that is if you, it, it continues on after his death. So if you look at, or if you have seen the Alexander Mosaic from the House of the Fallen in Pompeii, and you look at that image of his face, which I have on a very large poster on my wall behind me now, thanks to my parents as a Christmas gift. <laughs> it's oh, nice. If you look at that, you can see that he has, it's not just he's young and that he cannot grow a beard, because if you look at that image, he's got these kind of sideburns that come all the way down to the bottom of his jaw. Mm-hmm. So there's that implication of, oh no, I can grow facial hair. I'm a, I'm a man. I'm just choosing to be clean shaven because it's more important to me to be this image of kind of youth and almost Mm semi-divinity. By the way, I'll put for listeners, I'll put uh, links to some of these images in the show notes because yeah, if you haven't seen the Alexander mosaic, it's, it's worth looking at. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's so interesting that that is what has, what has kept on Mm -hmm. as part of his legacy and that he had kind of that deliberate change on what Mm -hmm. it meant to be seen as a king because you know caesar the roman emperors kept themselves clean shaven adult men in the senate were clean shaven and we know that you know part of that you cannot completely attribute to to alexander but you know the successors kept themselves largely clean shaven on their coin portraits also and they also on these attributes of alexander in terms of having their styling their hair long not quite as long but kind of keeping these visual symbols. So it's under Alexander, they become something else. Whereas before it'd be something you associated with divinity or with athletes. Under Alexander, it becomes part of what it means to look like a king, is to aspire to be youthful and almost semi-divine. Mm-hmm. Would you say it's it's an Apollonian specifically divinity that he's aiming or looking at? Because I mean that's what I think of when I think of the long haired and the the, you know, Zeus is still in statues depicted with a beard, for instance, or so is it Apollo 
Yeah, he's definitely kind of looking for an attribution with, with the younger gods. I mean, Di- you know, Dionysus, you get kind of Dionysus, of course. Yeah, Dionysus was a was an important, supposedly an important figure in in Alexander's life. His mother was, you know, had connections to the cult of Dionysus. Dionysus became an important figure throughout Alexander's Indian campaign because, in you know, the right. Greek mythology, Dionysus was brought wine from India. He was one of the only figures in their kind of mythological landscape who had ever traveled that far you know even heracles hadn't quite reached india but dionysus mm-hmm. had so you have you know instances of him having these massive drinking parties while out on campaign and dionysus features quite heavily in in these we're, we're told whether he's dressing up as dionysus which could be a bit of a <laughs> slanderous claim but supposedly he was fond of dressing up in kind of these you know, divine guises. So he's he's definitely aspiring to kind of the that that generation of of the Olympics, right. so kind of Apollo and, and and Dionysus, and taking on these attributes. But it's it's one of those yeah. kind of things, and it's like the the diadem as well. The diadem previous to Alexander doesn't really have much of a royal connotation. The diadem is something you might see with with athletes. Right, um, so right. The... I'm not quite 100 percent whether the diadem is because of the Dionysus connection, because you see Dionysus with a diadem, or whether it comes from part of Persian kingship, because in Persian kingship they also had a sort of mm. almost like a cloth a tiara almost. So it's kind of not a hundred percent sure whether this was kind of translated into kingship by Alexander specifically. That's kind of something that I am interested in but can never quite find a definitive answer for. I think it could be that the origins are a bit ambiguous, but we know that certainly it's not found as a signal of kingship before Alexander, but it is found as a signal of kingship after Alexander. So despite whether it originates from kind of, I guess, Eastern or Western influences, it's definitely within the nexus of his life, his campaigns, that this kind of transformation happens. And again, the diadem is something that you see with athletes who are, you know, young men and certainly not kings, Mm -hmm. and yet it becomes something kingly. Hmm. The parallels there to... So the Roman, so I don't want to talk too much necessarily about Rome, but when I, you know, Alexander, Alexander was big at Rome, let's just say. Yeah. <laughs> they liked him. They thought he was pretty cool. But in particular, when you talk about the statuary, the, you know, the obvious parallel there, and it's interesting because of who who picks up on Alexander as a, as a model, but the obvious parallel, just to stick to the statue stuff there, is is, is Augustus, of course who comes into a Roman tradition, not of kingship, but of leading men. Let's just, you know, the, the, the leading men of the Republic, a tradition where you see in the portraiture and in the ideology, you know, gravitas and senioritas, those are the important things. You want to be old, mm-hmm. you want to have gravitas, you want to be respectable and dignitas and, you know, all of these things, that's what's important. And so we see there's that the veristic style, which is a very misleading terminology, but the the older portraiture of the Republic tends to show very much warts and all to, in fact, an exaggerated and to our eyes quite comic degree. So you have these statues of of prominent men with massive amounts of wrinkles and like just sagging flesh and like just like the, nobody looks like that <laughs> actually. Like so, it's it's not really veristic. It's not people used to talk about it as being more true to life, but it's just as ideological as anything else. But what it's trying to portray is age and dignity, because that is what gives you weight as a senator. After all, the word senator means old man, like you have to be an old man. But you see in the late Republic a a change already that is influenced by the Greek styles, of course, which is what you're talking about, which have their own idealization of youth and beauty. And Alexander is a big part of that. But in particular, when you see Augustus or Octavian as he is come to power, you know, while he is in many ways not at all like Alexander, he does have some parallels, of course, in that he comes, he's 18, 19 when he's when Caesar is assassinated and he takes over. He cannot in any way pretend to the dignitas and seniority of the old Republican leaders. He, you know, he even even Antony, who's not all that old, is is at least older than him and is mature and does have a beard. And you see that on his coins. In fact, he's presented as bearded sometimes because he's military. So the military man does does wear a beard sometimes. But Octavian can't. He's just he's a he's a young man. He doesn't have any of that. So he, too, ends up being portrayed as a very young man. And really, there becomes this cult of sort of youth and beauty and he particularly connects to Apollo, becomes the important figure for him. 
and you get these images, which then outlast his, his, he doesn't die young. So he becomes an old man, but the statues stay young for a very, very long time because this has become, so he, so there too, you see a movement in a change that's driven in large part because nobody's going to believe an old, an image of Augustus or Octavian as a 25 year old with, you know, heavy wrinkles and the gravity of an old man. So he has to go for another. And Alexander gives him, Alexander and, and those models of kingship that you're talking about, give him an image and a, a way and a language, a visual language for expressing that power, even though he has none of the military <laughs> credits that Alexander has or any of those things, but he can still sort of, so you get that. And and what you look at Roman statuary and the number of people who have an Alexander hair specifically mm. the Alexander hairline is like, it's very funny because you could just see it on a whole series of, of statues. And the one that it's the most funny on is, is Pompey the Great, who is of course the person who very, who most obviously takes the Alexander myth for himself because he's also Magnus. Yeah. He gets, he takes the epithet and, and we have, you know, his contemporaries were very clear that he taught, took it as a, his friends started calling him that he didn't make up the nickname for himself, of course, <laughs> but you know, by, or by early, by his mid twenties, he's already going as Pompey de Magnus, which is, you know, many of the contemporaries thought was ludicrous and they thought it was a sign of his pretentiousness, but he's Magnus because Alexander is Magnus, because that's the term that's used in, in, in the Roman period. And, and he, so we have these busts of him as a middle-aged man and, and his face is being portrayed in the older Roman style of like, with wrinkles, looks like a Roman statesman, but he's got Alexander's hairline. And it's amazing. <laughs> it's just like this yeah. visual representation of how, of, of, of what was in flux and what was going on in the late Republic of, of issues of leadership of, you know, trying to have the Republican senatorial gravitas, but also to be the one singular great general who transforms the world in the same, you know, in the same bust. It's, it's, just, it's great. <laughs> yeah. I, I can visualize the one that I, I think you mean and his hair. Yeah. It's, it's the it's most famous one of him, I think. Yeah. 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 It looks a bit, it doesn't, it just looks like he's kind of woken up and that it's all a bit askew. It's almost, I do sometimes wonder, I mean, I don't know how much you, you know about UK politics, but you know, Boris, <laughs> the current prime mm -hmm. minister is a, it, notorious or should that be infamous you know lover of classics and classical illusions and his hair mm -hmm. is always deliberately ridiculous and i do wonder is he trying to kind of pull off <laughs> in a it's... strange perverse way this this alexander you know tossled lot yeah. failing miserably it wouldn't surprise me supposedly he does compare himself to Alexander the Great in a very not charming, very sickly manner, I would imagine. But, um, oh, yeah, yeah, just wait until we get the leaks of his friends call him Magnus. His well, friends, friends call him Boris apparently, the Great. Apparently some of the maids do, did have him his nickname in their phone as Alexander the Great. His middle name oh is, my God. one of his middle names is Alexander. So I always get dragged into these conversations unwillingly about, you know, it's terrible, <laughs> terrible people. I think I, I tweeted about it recently saying it makes me look bad by association because every time it's in the news that a terrible man, whether it's Jeff Bezos or Boris Johnson, is comparing himself to Alexander <laughs> Craig, I inevitably get sent the article and I just have to grit my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I think, I mean, I mean, yeah, I think that's a really good parallel because there's that same attempt to sort of find, you know, again, Boris Johnson doesn't have, didn't, you know, wasn't an elder statesman when he entered the political arena couldn't go for that model. Mm. So, you know, I don't think it's, even if it's not deliberately Alexander, I think it's possibly motivated by a similar. I, a, a I similar think it, I, that's my theory. I think it may be kind of one of these little hidden artifices that's very Etonian is, oh, I'm going to mess up yeah. my face to look like Alexander and no one else will get the in joke, but I will. So I have a feeling that mm. that... <laughs> I, I you've persuaded me. <laughs> it will make me hate his 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 image on my monitor even more. Next, <laughs> next time, you. next time you see an image of him where he's looking, you know, <laughs> deliberately tussled as always, <laughs> just keep it in mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's so interesting because you know, so because Alexander becomes this figure of legend that you're talking about, and this exemplar, and I mean. Plutarch is does it the most obviously by comparing 
Alexander and Caesar in his parallel lives, Rome really does take him on as the exemplar of the great general and the great con- conqueror. And everybody is to some extent compared to him for good or for bad, because he has all those negative qualities too. You know, comparing Julius Caesar to Alexander the Great is not purely complimentary <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> for a Roman, for sure. But I thought it, it's really, I, I, I find him quite fascinating as a, as a figure in, in Roman thought. And we have like, there's a poem by Catullus that has this whole ends of the earth trope. That's like, my, my friends are such good friends, they would go to the ends of the earth. And I read a nice little article that, that says, you know, the first, first pair, first stanza is definitely Alexander the Great. The second is definitely about Pompey and Pompey's Eastern conquests. And then the third paragraph has this geographical stuff that explicitly says it's the monuments of Magnus Caesar, of, of great Caesar. Mm-hmm. So the Magnus is only used in that third stanza, but so the argument goes that the, the other two stanzas are referring to the other two Magni, the other two greats. And it's the only place that I know of where Caesar gets that epithet. So he didn't in the end, like that wasn't an epithet that was used for him, but it's being very deliberately compared. And I just like that, uh, being able to sort of see how the discourse of Alexander as good and bad gets worked into Roman conceptions of their own leaders and, and transforms or gives them someone to think with, if to think, mm-hmm. to say, you know, as the, as the gr- huge expansion, especially during the period of expansion in the late Republic, when, you know, people are going out and conquer- conquering swaths of land and bringing Romanness, whatever that does and doesn't mean at that time. Mm. So. I can't I can't quite remember who where I I read it in Diana Spencer's Roman Alexander which is which is one of the books mm-hmm. that I really enjoy on Alexander and I know that she didn't come up with this phrasing she borrowed from somebody else but I can't remember who the somebody else is but like it, it in it Alexander's referred to as as like a wine skin in that uh. you almost fill in with any kind of you know any kind of wine to have your complete product that he is just kind of the shell that gets filled with whatever it needs to be filled with to make the point and I think that mm-hmm. that idea when I first read it has has really stuck with me I think the more I think about it the more I, I think it's it's true mm-hmm. but it was a very interesting idea to think that he kind of provides I guess this very convenient package in which you put your own substance in order to you know use him for whatever purpose you want and I definitely think that's certainly the case with him in, in the Roman world that he kind of is mm-hmm is this package that they can just imbue with their own meaning, depending on what they need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you can use them to, to criticize or to praise, for instance, or to do both at once. If you want to sort of be able to speak outside both sides of your mouth, which is, can be useful in yeah. certain contexts, especially when you get into the Imperial period. And then, yeah. And it's interesting that when I was, I assumed and I kind of looked for stuff and I haven't read that by Diana Spencer. I haven't read that, but I should because that sounds really interesting and I love her stuff. But I was looking for Antony as Alexander. He seemed like the obvious, you know, that surely people connected Antony with Alexander and and or that his own propaganda did. I mean, he certainly connected himself with Dionysus. There's that. And then, you know, he ends up with a Ptolemy. And mm-hmm. he has the Eastern conquests and, and that, that Eastern connection. I didn't see, but I, I, I'm going to admit I did a fairly superficial search. So <laughs> I may have missed some very, very obvious stuff, yeah. but I didn't see a lot of, of comparisons on that. Mm-hmm. And I was a little surprised by that because he seems like such an obvious comparison uh, mm-hmm. or connection to Antony to be used either as by himself as as a good thing especially in the east where alexander's legacy is probably was probably more positive and as a way of attacking him by by roman sources yeah N- not to sound like i've only read one book but uh, <laughs> Sp- i i remember spencer mentioning mentioning that when talking about these kind of roman alexanders but i didn't i wasn't very convinced i didn't think there was enough kind of Right. evidence to support that but it is an interesting question of well why or why not because again it seems like it's a he would be a prime um exemplar to use to either to praise or detract because you could say well you know he's alexander because he thinks he's great but is he really alexander because he's you know licentious and drunk and all these other things which is definitely a side of alexander that people do and did pick up on so it would be kind of a very good um comparison point to make so it is it is an interesting idea definitely but I'm not sure if they ever ever did. I'm I'm I can't think of anything that comes to to mind that I've read. So it seems like they missed an opportunity. 
<laughs> the other thing that I was wondering about the construction of Alexander, you know, you mentioned that the sort of Homeric connection and, you know, Alexander is as, as kind of Achilles, but, but the other, I think the other comparison that can be made is, is Hercules and particularly it, it, the sort of aspect of Alexander that is Alexander, the, the monster killer. Cause that was certainly an image of Alexander that was very popular in the middle ages. And so that, you know, there's Alexander's letter to Aristotle and all these uh, works that, you know, talk about wonder, the wonders of the East that he saw. And that kind of also leads me to thinking about modern reception and, you know, is there a place for that Alexander still, or, or are we just, you know, making movies about the so-called true history of, you know, figures like Alexander? The, the Heracles comparison is is very important. I think during Alexander's lifetime, that's certainly the, you know, the mythological precedent that was almost more kind of applicable to him. The his his royal family, the Argeid line in Macedon, they trace their lineage from a descendant of Heracles. So Heracles features quite prominently in their kind of royal image. So the coins of his father, Philip II, coins of his sort of earlier ancestors as well, featured the image of Heracles, whether it was literally Heracles' profile with the lion cap or whether it was the club. He was featured on their coinage because he was a known and admired ancestor for Alexander and his father. There's because the the Persian campaign itself as an idea had been around for quite a while, you know, beginning of the fourth century, you know, there, there was a Spartan king who'd wanted to go on this Persian campaign, but it never took off the ground. And it was originally going to be Philip II's campaign. He was going to be the one who was going to go to Persia. And I guess Alexander would be his his general, his right-hand man, but he wouldn't be the leading force. That would be Philip. And there is a speech by Isocrates, who was kind of pro, pro-Philip. He was one of the voices that was, you know, for him rather than against him, like the likes of Demosthenes. And in one of these speeches, he he compares Philip to Heracles, saying, you know, you're going to be our Heracles and you're going to go and you know, conquer Persia, like Heracles conquered Troy, you know, like the story of Heracles before Achilles conquering Mm -hmm. um, Troy. So there is this existing comparison. And then during Alexander's lifetime, he, he, you know, he took on this comparison and openly welcomed it. You know, there's there's some kind of speaking ancient sources that he may have had uh, an illegitimate son with a Persian noblewoman who may have been named Heracles. So he's taking that on to be a figure of importance to him. Supposedly, he was very motivated by his mythological ancestors. They kind of were an example to emulate, but also to surpass. If there's one defining characteristic of Alexander, it's just this innate and absolutely extreme competitiveness. You know, supposedly, as Arian and, and some of the other sources make this comparison quite explicit, saying, well, you know, the only reason he tried to siege the Aeonos rock is because in legend, Heracles did it and failed. So that's mm-hmm. what dragged his men there to go on this siege because he was trying to outdo Heracles specifically by name, because this is one of his, you know, named adventures and you know we right. can't know alexander's mind we can't know if that's true but it's certainly that's how historians of the period considered it mm-hmm. and one of the my most recent thesis my emlet dissertation that i just submitted in the summer uh was sort of a case study basis i looked at the so-called alexander sarcophagus which is an absolutely beautiful, beautiful monument. But it's not the sarcophagus of Alexander at all. It belongs to somebody else entirely, somebody who was an associate of Alexander, supposedly a man called Abdelonymus, who is the last king of Sidon, who was established as king by Alexander. But it gets its name from one of the highly decorated friezes, which is a hunting scene in which we see Alexander on horseback. And the reason why it's been identified as Alexander is because he's wearing this Heracles cap this lion cap uh-huh. right and it's it's like very because nobody else is in kind of this divine costuming everyone else is very brilliantly exquisitely dressed but it's such an explicit allusion to a heroic mm-hmm. figure if you were to see that out of context you would say well it must be heracles because you see a picture of a guy with a lion skin hat you know that's her mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's his, that's his that's his defining outfit and yet we know that it's alexander and there's some i think it's in a fragment of of athenaeus who mentions that towards the end of his life when he's supposedly you know 
if you believe kind of the general trajectory of his life, he's kind of spiraling out of control, getting a little bit bigger for his boots. He starts kind of wearing this this heroic costume as Heracles, mm-hmm. kind of Alexander in the guise of Heracles. And right. some of his later coinage that was sort of minted during his lifetime, there's a debate over whether we are meant to read these portraits which is on the face of it a portrait of Heracles in profile but are we supposed to read that actually as a pseudo portrait of Alexander are we actually looking Mm. at what is Alexander's face with a Heracles cap but it's kind of obscuring it so it's a way for him to sneakily put his own face on his coins during his lifetime which would be a massive massive jump because although Alexander's face was the first to be put on coinage it would, you know, be borderline sacrilegious to put a mortal face of a mortal man on coinage when that's something that had been really reserved for honouring the gods or honouring important heroes. Mm. So there's some debate over whether we're supposed to read it as a pseudo-portrait or whether it's just a coincidence, because typically Heracles' portraits of sort of earlier Macedonian mints, you see, again, Heracles with kind of a little, like, stubbly beard. That's how you know it's him. Whereas some of the portraits that were minted late in Alexander's reign and early in the successors who chose to continue the Alexander types the man wearing the Heracles cap is clearly very youthful. So right. it's probably just being an aged down Heracles, because of course you do have kind of the artistic tradition of the young Heracles versus the old Heracles, whether his, he's, you know, pre-labors, post-labors, or is mm-hmm. it the Alexander with the Heracles cap? And there's kind of arguments on either side for, for what that represents. But Heracles is definitely an important figure for alexander to emulate during his lifetime and also one that the successors will will continue they continue putting kind of heracles caps on portraits of alexander if you some kind of search for alexander in the guise of heracles there are quite a lot but also in this time it's kind of six of one half a dozen of the other because images that were produced of heracles now that are intended to be heracles now kind of look a bit Alexandrian because the two traditions are kind of coming together. Now we have an Alexander-inspired Heracles as much as we have a Heracles-inspired Alexander. So you kind of got this kind of de-aging of Heracles as well in right. Hellenistic artistic traditions. But Which I- really opens him up to the, cl- the claiming of Heracles by some of the Roman emperors, in fact, because you, can, you can't help but think of people like Commodus, because the, the, the youthful Heracles is an easier model for them too. So yeah, that's interesting. But I think certainly, again, why the best thing that Alexander ever did was die young. That yeah. <laughs> that suddenly makes the Achilles parallel so much more yes. interesting. Yes. That's mm-hmm. something that Alexander, in his lifetime, presumably couldn't have anticipated. One would assume that he wanted to live long and continue campaigning for as long as possible. You know, his father Philip was campaigning mm-hmm. into his forties. You know, but Achilles would have died. I suppose you know the ages in the Iliad and Homer never really make sense. But you would, <laughs> you would guess that the idea is that, you know, he left to Troy a young man, you would guess maybe early 20s. By the end mm-hmm. of the war, he's probably early 30s. So he mm-hmm. kind of is almost of a similar age, at least a similar life stage. They both die young. They both die in this kind of blaze of glory. You know, they both die shortly after their, you know, preferred companion dies. So the, the parallels kind of write themselves, but they write themselves posthumously with that knowledge of what happened. And that's why it's such a a common comparison point in the later literature because you know Achilles Achilles and Alexander exist as a as a comparative point in Alexander's own lifetime we know that he was also descended from Achilles on his mother's side he had these mm-hmm. two very illustrious ancestors from which he could draw upon when it was useful to him so when he's kind of campaigning around the Hellespont he visits the site at Troy supposedly he offers right. sacrifices to you know the, the tomb and the temple of Priam the temple of Athena he goes on this naked foot race to try and emulate <laughs> you know Achilles so he does do these little things mm-hmm. when emulating Achilles deliberately if you know if we take for the fact this happened but then he kind of changes who his model is depending on where it is most appropriate so as he moves kind of further on eastward Achilles is no longer so interesting now it becomes right. more of a oh and now I need to adopt the guise of Heracles because you know that this was Heracles's stomping ground and then as he goes even further east he goes well we know that Dionysus was around here so now I'm going to start dressing up as Dionysus yeah. So he's kind mm-hmm. of like a like a PR mogul. He almost picks his image <laughs> he kind of knows will will suit better. But definitely this kind of Homeric, Achillean comparison point is a very 
it's a very pleasing one to us in modernity looking backwards because we can see that obvious parallel whereas Heracles kind of you know grew to be older married had children Mm -hmm. again had more children and that's not quite something that Alexander managed to achieve so I think Heracles is the more important ancestor in his lifetime but seeing how the story pans out I think that's what makes Achilles and the Homeric angle more appealing to us yeah did you want to talk a little bit about that Alexander's let the letter to Aristotle that you mentioned? Well, yeah, and, and just in terms of its its focus on on the monsters and mm-hmm. the wonders, and you know Alexander as explorer. What is the the context for that work? Just to well, it's it's a late antique Latin original based on a originally a Greek text. And it gets translated into Old English, and it's but it it remains popular throughout the Middle Ages because of the monster content. Right. And so, it the Old English text is in the Beowulf manuscript, which seems to have been a monster manuscript. All the texts in it, the, that's the one thing they have in common is that they have monsters. Right, and so that you know that places that version of it in what the well <laughs> the Beowulf manuscript. Just tell me when that is, Mark. And that's uh, not a famously <laughs> complicated question or anything, but like eighth century ish. Oh well, the manuscript. Itself is quite late. It's probably as late as 11th century okay. by some claims. Okay. And so, and so, this is a letter that purports to be Alexander writing back to Aristotle, right? Yeah, because I'm thinking of that in, in terms of that Achillean parallel. One of the things that parallels is the early life of Achilles and his tutors, right? Like the right. The, the mythical, not the Iliad, but the non-Iliadic tradition, which has him being tutored by Chiron and and his various other tutors, and and that that idea of the the youthful hero learning, and you talked about that earlier, Meg, the, you know, the youthful hero who learns from the great masters and Aristotle figures importantly into yeah. that, to that. Well, and the way it's, it's sort of framed is that Alexander is writing to Aristotle to say, look at all the amazing things I've done. You can be proud. I want you to be proud of me mm-hmm. because obviously I'm just fantastic. <laughs> like it's, it's not subtle at all in its self praise. <laughs> right. So I may have learned some things from you, but not modesty. <laughs> yeah. And that's where we get those. Those are, it's no, the ants are in Herodotus. What, what are the monsters that he, some of the monsters he talks about? Oh, uh, I mean, it's some that we think we can trace. So like, there seems to be a, a description of hippopotamuses mm. and crocodiles, but there's also like, you know, various like bat-like things mm-hmm. and you know i think the large snakes there's definitely mm-hmm. snakes mentioned a few times and yeah so all, all kinds of you know unusual animals of unusual size <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and does he also describe like dog-headed people and stuff like that or is that in another is that another uh the, i'm trying to remember i'm trying yeah I, I get east. get it confused with wonders of the east because they're in the same manuscript mm-hmm. and which monsters and there's overlap there right. for sure and, and in fact alexander is mentioned by name in of the east as well so the the dog-headed people that might be wonders of the east I that think. might be wonders <laughs> of the east I can't remember but yeah but it's all they're all of a piece anyway so that's where alexander goes and i don't think any of that like you say it has a Greek manuscript, but not, not an early, like this is no, completely no, no. made up it's, tradition. It's com- yeah. much later. Yeah. I don't know if you know any, but think about the Alexander romances and things like that, Meg, if that's something you've looked at. It's, it's not something that I, I've looked at before, but it's something that I've always kind of had a passing interest in because what yeah. I find fascinating is some of the, the examples of, I don't know what they call them. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not a medievalist, but the images, these beautiful images, they've got a load in the British library Mm-hmm. And he's kind of Alexander the Explorer, and there's a really recurring motif of he's in like a glass jar under the sea. Like, oh yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, it's a submarine. That's uh, right. Yeah. The first kind of interaction of as a submarine, and he looks like a little. He looks like a little medieval king because he's got a kind of little like spiky hair and his little hat, and he's all kind of in like lo- lo- <laughs> yeah. lovely red robes. But he's Alexander because he's exploring and he's, you know, being dragged along the seabed in this glass jar, looking at all the fantastic sea creatures. And I yeah. just think that is so brilliant. I don't know if I can put yeah. a scholarly thought on it because it seems so bizarre to me, but I just think it's amazing. <laughs> There's yeah, my the favorite way. one. He's got like a chi- he's got like what looks like a cat and like a cockerel in the in the jar with him. <laughs> I don't know why, but I just I just think it's amazing. It's, it's such a spirited image. I just think they're they're so mm-hmm. lovely and fantastic. Yeah, the, the 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 submarine thing. It's not in the letter to Aristotle, but it, it yeah, it is there in a lot of the medieval sources. They re- repeat that story. So that he goes down to the 
under the sea under to the sea yeah to, yeah and it's that idea of, of wanting to find out <laughs> the, the curiosity right mm-hmm. like the mm-hmm. yeah and of course in speaking of alexander as a wineskin the middle age you know the medieval mind is very happy to do things like take a figure from the ancient world and put him in contemporary yeah clothes yeah. and like that's how they tend to you know, work all of their, how, how they think about people from the past is as contemporaries, mm-hmm. always. There's a, a historicalness to that. And so he's a very useful wineskin for them. Because <laughs> by there, yeah. I love those stories too. Those, yeah, the, you're talking manuscript eliminations, I think is, is the, some of the things, images you're talking about. Yeah. 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 I just, I just like looking for them and just seeing them and thinking, my gosh, that's so, that's so brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alexander thought he was all that in his own lifetime, but if he'd understood what he'd become look, later. <laughs> look what he's getting up to now. And I just, you know, I just think it's, like I said, if there's anything we can kind of say about Alexander is that he's just fiercely competitive and definitely explorative <laughs> nature, whether that's because of this enlightened scholar persona mm-hmm. that he gets given or whether it's because he's a tyrant who just wants more places to, you know, vanquish. Either way, mm-hmm. whichever, whatever the motivation, you know that he's an explorer and that he's a he's a, you know, a traveler. And I would love to, I always say like, you know, Alexander would be going into space to fight the aliens. That's just something that I <laughs> in his persona, you know, he's, he's going under the submarine in a, in a medieval glass jar on string. <laughs> he would absolutely fire me into space. I want to know what's out there. So I, you know, kill them, rob them or whatever reason. <laughs> name, name a planet after myself because <laughs> yeah, I just think he would... if he's going to space, every planet would be called Alexander. <laughs> we just have <laughs> Alexander one, two, three, four. Okay. You know, if you think about, I mean, obviously, you know, Star Trek Enterprise is all about being a bit more, a bit more nice, but I just think mm-hmm. he, he would be a great Star Trek Enterprise villain where he's just going to all these planets. <laughs> Calling them Alexandria. <laughs> on. I know. I, d- I, I did a little bit of brief research thinking, oh, is, is there an Alexander and Doctor Who angle? And then oh, yeah. a very tiny one, but not enough. I was a bit disappointed. I was like, I wish they That's true. <laughs> they didn't that's true. They totally should have gone back to Alexander. There was like an old Doctor Who episode. And then there's been like a couple of like radio episodes. And I think maybe he appears in like a couple of the novelizations and that's it. And I was like, no, we need mm-hmm. like full on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we need a proper a proper episode, we need right? a full episode because if there's anyone that you could take from history to kind of be an explorer figure or a tyrant figure in any yes. sense, yeah. I think Alexander is the perfect versatile model for that. Oh, that'd be awesome. All right. Well, on that note, why don't we finish off by talking a little bit about modern reception? We've touched on, on you know a number of political and other other contexts, but I mean the the obvious elephant, if you'll forgive me, in the room <laughs> is is the Alexander movie and other sort of on screen depictions. Though I say that, are there other like what are the what are the does the movie that I'm thinking of the not that recent anymore, but recent Alexander movie, are there other major depictions of him? Well, there was a, there was a, there's a 1956 film that Mm. whenever I bring this out, nobody believes me at first that Richard Burton was Alexander the great. (laughs) There's an Anthony connection for you. (laughs) (laughs) And it's, it's kind of gotten lost to the annals of time, I think because it was so bad, but (laughs) (laughs) you know one of these you know sort of a fairly, i think it was a fairly big budget epic as you know right. epic historical drama film from the from the 1950s you would have thought it would be right up there with some of the greats you know it's you know i think you know jason the argonauts came out not long after that and then cleopatra right. killed it off in the late 60s <laughs> but you know richard burton quite a big actor was was alexander in this right and yet it kind of no one kind of really watches it i'm desperate to try and track it down but i can't find anywhere to watch it and hmm. i don't know <laughs> how to but I think it's quite amazing so and then obviously you've got the massive you know the elephant in the room which I think is an absolutely fantastic scene as the great elephant scenes in that film yeah <laughs> 2004 Oliver Stone but apparently that the 2004 Oliver Stone had been in production for a very long time they'd been kind of thinking about it since the 90s and mm-hmm. it, it, it was part of there was originally going to be a different one filmed I think the film directed by Baz Luhrmann which was set to have Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> Alexander which I now can't even envision <laughs> I don't even know no. what 
what that would look like. A, ba- a Baz Luhrmann's Alexander just sounds absolutely you know, amazing. Like, frankly, come on, <laughs> amazing, but, you know, wild. And then there was, yeah. um, I think, I don't know if it had a theatrical release. So I can't think, but there's like a film, Young Alexander, with I think, oh gosh, what was the actor's name? He's the He's the main lead, um, Sam Hewen, I think, is, is he's like mm. the main lead in Outlander and, and things like that. There was a film, The Young Alexander, about kind of him him growing up, and that was in 2010, right. but I don't think it was a big blockbuster. So people are still kind of churning out things about, about Alexander, and he still kind of has a presence on screen. But I think the 2004 film was such a... Even if it, it, I mean, it was a box office flop. I was reading about it recently because I have this idea for a project, which I may not see through, but I want to, where I want to watch the original theatrical release version mm-hmm. and then watch the the final version because the final version is three and a half hours long. Mm-hmm. And there were like, there were multiple in between, right? He, he yeah. released, there's at least three, is it three or four different yeah, cuts of the film? four because I was trying to sort mm-hmm. out Technology of it because I couldn't find a definitive answer, so I had to I had to kind of work out my own. There's been four separate cuts <laughs> of the film, and I think if I get it right, the original film was in chronological order, mm-hmm. and then the second release they took out like ten minutes of footage and put back in seven, so it was slightly different. And then they did another cut, which I believe is the director's the director's cut was what changed that but then the ultimate cut is what added in so much length and decided to chop it up and make it not chronological order and, mm-hmm. that- and make it flashbacks and stuff right yes, yeah huge narrative change so i think depending on who you ask is <laughs> whether they've seen it in chronological order or whether they've seen it through kind of flashbacks mm-hmm with and the then, Ptolemy narrative, yeah. Yeah, the Ptolemy narrative, which I found very interesting, actually. I quite liked the Ptolemy angle. I, I gasped aloud at the end where Ptolemy goes, yeah, we killed him. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, I Oliver Stone's all about making a definitive answer to, you know, <laughs> who killed, you know, I've been, <laughs> who died. I've been, I've been sitting there for three hours and 20 minutes. And I think mm-hmm. I, my emotions were just frayed by the end. <laughs> <laughs> so that that revelation was enough to kind of kind of get me. But I mean, it's certainly a very interesting film. I think that the kind of the history of the film and the backlash mm-hmm. of the film, you could almost do like a a semester word course on the film of Alexander the Great because it was just <laughs> so bizarre. You know, the fact that there was a team of forty Greek lawyers who teamed up to try and I don't know what they were. Their aim was whether they were trying to sue or get it to be stopped showed in theatres. They wanted to do something because they felt that they were depicting Alexander as being too homosexual. But then in a later cut, Oliver Stone added in 40 minutes of footage, which included, I think, half an hour of that was, you know, homosexual activity. There was a lot of, you know, things that were, were changed. So it's such an interesting kind of piece of little history on, on you know when it when it came out and how people mm-hmm. related that to you know the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan mm-hmm. and where it was taking place on location which is kind of more of a more of a coincidence than intention I think because it had been in production for a long time previous but it kind of came at this moment where there was a lot mm-hmm. of happening in that area of the world and there was a lot of kind of you know, I think it had a lot of backlash as well on the depiction of the Persians, how they were just kind of an amalgamation of anything vaguely Eastern looking. They looked more like the mm. Taliban than they looked like, you know, ancient Persians. Iranians, yeah. So there was, it's a very kind of, it's difficult to say whether it's a good or a bad film. I always think thinking of things in terms of good or bad is is not helpful. I think it's more, mm. I think it's, it's a fatally interesting film, but perhaps for all the wrong reasons. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and I think it, yeah, it, it does. It, that does bring up another, we don't need to get in that deep, deep discussion of it, but one of the other important sort of ramifications of the Alexander story is that East-West, you know, the solidifying of those East-West divisions. And uh, we, you hinted at it already, but the, the question of like Hellenism, Hellenism and Hellenization and the, the, the clash of civilizations narrative and stuff, which is one might say very different maybe in some of the source texts or than it is in its interpretation three, 400 years later. And then again, very different in its interpretation now and, you know, had, but has these really long-term ramifications and any depiction of it on screen by Hollywood, you know, team is going to inevitably get involved in that kind of, you know, that, that ongoing mytholo- mythologizing of, 
East versus West and where you draw the lines and what who is Eastern and who is Western and what the civilizations are and 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 come into those problems. And and you know, I think I think it's an interesting movie from that perspective too. It gives you a particular snapshot of of those lines and where they're being drawn and how they're being drawn and, and who sees themselves in the movie and doesn't and all of those things too. Hmm. It's a very, it's a very interesting film because it kind of, it's so visually, you know, stunning. I still think you look mm-hmm. at it and you think you can see where the money was spent. You know, the, the scene where he enters Babylon and it's just hordes of people and the beautiful bright blue Ishtar gates and the rose mm-hmm. petals and he's kind of, you know, basking in this moment. It does, make you feel something whether it's you know fury or awe it kind of really does inspire a, a deep emotion mm-hmm. in it. I think it's I think it's just a bit of a it's a kind of a confused film because I think it makes the mistake of trying to put too much in because you know as we as we so spoken about there's so many facets to Alexander's character and so many aspects that it's so difficult to create a cohesive narrative because the narrative really isn't kind of cohesive. <laughs> it's, it, mm-hmm. By nature, you know, the sources are flawed. If you try and put in everything you know, it's not going to make any sense. And I was speaking with my, my brother's a film studies, you know, wannabe scholar. He's just finished his master's in film studies. So he knows more about it from a technical point of view than I do. But we were talking about it. And from his perspective, it's a very good film because you know he doesn't mind the fact that it's not chronological he thinks that's interesting it's kind of avant-garde mm-hmm. at all whereas I think it's just got too much in it I think what I took away from it especially kind of I guess it's not really a twist but to me it was a twist the twist at the end where Ptolemy's like yeah we killed him you know because he was a dreamer and he was going to get us all killed that's what dreamers do they just don't they don't they're not grounded in reality I thought that was a very interesting angle that I wish had been more prominent throughout Right. Because the right. thing that I took away from it was, we, you know, I'm I'm tired of seeing Alexander as the hero. I know that arguably that is his role, but I would love to see him as he's he's the hero of his own story, but the villain of everyone else's. Mm-hmm. You, you mm-hmm. see that scene where you've got the Macedonians. I don't know where they are. I don't know where they went. That's cold. They must be in the mountains somewhere. And you kind of see all these Macedonians bundled up, and it's snowing, and they've got frosty eyebrows, and all their men are dying. <laughs> And you just think, oh my God, Alexander, you monster, let them go home. Mm-hmm. You know, they they kind of amalgamate the mutiny between Opus and Hephaestus, which I'm not really angry with because I understand the constrictions of filmmaking. You have to amalgamate a bunch of battles and a bunch of similar events right. because you can't depict every single one. You know, and, and they're arguing with him. And I think it, it's the character is, is of Craterus kind of says, you know, this is enough now. We need to go. Look what you've done to us. This is this is horrible. And I kind of, I, there was moments like that, but those, those are like the only two moments within a three and a half hour film, plus right. mm-hmm. Ptolemy's reveal at the end. And I think it would have been a much more interesting film if that had been a more cohesive and coherent strand. I quite like the frame narrative with Ptolemy narrating it. I, I thought, especially with the chopped up chronology, that made sense because I think it did, you know, I've read kind of interviews of Oliver Stone afterwards and I've read, you know, sort of reviews of it. And what Oliver Stone kind of says his vision for it was, was to kind of show that history is not what happened. It's how it's written about what happened and how people right. construct his image. And I think that is the function of Ptolemy as the narration character. And I think that's a really good point. I think that's, you know, that's kind of what I harp on about all the time is we don't <laughs> actually know Alexander. We just know his constructed character. But that doesn't mean it's not interesting. In fact, it's almost more interesting because you get to see so many different kind of perspectives through history as soon as you let go of this idea of the real Alexander it kind of opens up so many more opportunities so I do mm-hmm. think that the heart of it Oliver Stone's film has some good pieces I would just like to remake it and <laughs> kind of make that strand more apparent because I think that would be a very interesting and perhaps new take on mm-hmm. bringing Alexander to the big screen is not convincing us that he's a hero but perhaps showing that he's a hero within his own bubble but really that bubble didn't help anyone else he's a villain of everyone else's story he's a villain to his own people because he drags them around and makes them suffer for 10 years he's an obvious villain to the persians because he comes and burns down all of their things and i think (laughs) that that could be you know a brave telling that would probably you know land me on a couple of you know hit lists i would imagine from yeah (laughs) Yeah, i I think it might be a little bit uh, it would be be, it would have an interesting reception let's say put it that way yeah (laughs) I mean, I think, but I think what he is, he's the hero of his own yeah. story. 
And, whether and he gets the- used as a hero by other people for their own purposes in the same way, which is yeah. not the same as being a hero. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I think the film owes quite a debt to the work of Mary Reynolds and her kind of fiction novels of the 50s and mm-hmm. 60s and this kind of very, very romantic, but very kind of brutal landscape that she paints of the the ancient world. I, I really like Mary Reynolds' books. I think they are fantastic. Mm-hmm. But, you know, her image of Alexander is definitely one of this kind of almost like a scholarly soul. He's quite a sensitive soul. Right. You know, he's he's kind of he you know, he he's a queer individual. He has these very intense, you know, homoerotic relationships with, you know, his his childhood best friend mm-hmm. and this kind of wonderfully exotic, you know, beautiful and patient eunuch that he meets later in life. So he's he's almost like a like a he's you know, he's sensitive, he's kind of mm-hmm. you know, but he's also kind of violent, but he's also, you know, kind of intelligent and kind of philosophical. And like right. that is it's you know it's a fictional portrayal but it's definitely based in real world alexander scholarship you know it's it takes a lot from tarn you know robin lane fox's influential biography of the 70s kind of towed a similar line of oh well everything he does is quite brilliant so i think he can really mm-hmm. trace back oliver stone's inspiration because the character of of Bagoas, who is this you know this persian eunuch that alexander had an intimate relationship with later in life supposedly i mean it's it is there it's there in a couple of instances in the original like ancient source work but then again you get historians who are kind of eliding that for their own reasons they don't want to talk about that because it's it's a bit iffy from their perspective but the fact that he's a fully fleshed character he has a speaking role he has a whole sequence he has a sex scene which they're Mm -hmm. in the film one of which is with alexander's wife (laughs) the other which is with (laughs) you know, this this Persian eunuch. And this is in Oliver Stone's extended edition with the additional 40 minutes of footage. He kind of adds in this whole character arc of this, not a new character, but this character that really rose to prominence in Mary Reynolds' novel. He's, he's, a, he's a protagonist character in those novels when outside of that, he only exists in a couple of lines from from ancient history. Right. So it's, right. it's kind of Oliver Stone vis-a-vis Robin Lane Fox, who was the, you know, advisor for the film vis-a-vis like, yeah, very yeah. Well. it's kind of shades of receptions of receptions yeah i think alexander much like even though there are many 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 more hercules movies than there are alexander movies you get a similar thing in the various media like, like receptions of alexander where you get to see visions of masculinity and visions of heroism reshaped by each period you know so you get a different hercules in different movies because our ideas of masculinity and heroism change or whatever. And I think the uh, representations of Alexander, it's, it's he's a different figure in spite of his connections to El- Hercules, but you see a sort of similar metamorphosis going on. Who, who do we think of as, as our visions of manhood? <laughs> yeah. He's, he's a very, he's a very complex Something that I want to watch, which I don't know if I'll be able to. <laughs> There's like a like an Indian TV serial um, called Porus, which is about the Indian mm. king Porus and his defeat of Alexander, supposedly because this battle of the Hidaspes, right. Alexander fought Persian king Porus. One of my best friends, who whose family is from India, he's Indian, was telling me, well, you know, in our kind of folk tradition, Porus won and repelled Alexander mm. from India. I was like, oh, that's mm. interesting because in like in the sources that we have written down. Alexander Alexander won, but he just kind of said, oh, you fought really well, so how about I don't go into your territory and we just call it, like, you know, call it... Call it quits, yeah. <laughs> we just, like, call it here, and I'm, like, king or whatever, but you can, like, keep everything, and I'll just, like, name a couple cities and then bounce. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. So, like, it's a very odd sort of... And even though, I mean, people have kind of spoken about this before, like, oh, did Alexander actually lose the battle? And, you know, I mean, there's evidence to think, well, I don't think he'd be able to get away with naming you know, a, a settlement on the river victory if he lost. I don't think you'd be able to get away with that. I know you can lie, but kind of <laughs> a lot of evidence and things, well, I don't think you'd get away with it if he lost. But I definitely makes me think there's more to that story than we think. I think I'd say it's probably more of a draw than a victory, mm-hmm. what I would imagine. But there's Or a, a victory that he couldn't hold on to, like a victory yeah. that maybe he won on the battlefield that day but was well aware there was no way he was going to be able to keep going. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. This, this this Indian TV um, program, which I think is, there's like 300 episodes, because when they do programs, they do it like 
big it's like in detail about <laughs> everything so you know it's about porous but in order to understand porous's victory about alexander you have to know about alexander so there's characters cast to be his mother his father his childhood him growing up wow. Wow. And I would love to watch it because it looks absolutely spectacular just image wise, but it's not available to watch in Europe with English subtitles, I'm afraid. So unfortunately, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm very interested to see what that story is, because that very well may be what I'm looking for, where Alexander is the hero of his own story and the villain of everyone else's. Right. It's right. probably going to be a very interesting thing. So I hope one day I'll be able to, <laughs> to watch it. But I know that it's I'm aware that it's out there and that there is kind of media in other from other regions in other languages that mm -hmm. you know deal with alexander talk about alexander because of course he's not just the property of you know the english-speaking world there's going to be receptions of alexander in all these different areas which you know unfortunately i'm limited by to access but that's you know that's my loss really because i'm sure that they are just as rich and just as interesting but it is mm -hmm. it is fascinating that there is you know more out there and it looks i think if you google porous like tv thing you can just see by the images of Alexander, it's absolutely fantastic. He's wearing like this, you know, bright blonde wig, these kind of piercing <laughs> eyes, the costuming is so, you know, vibrant. And even if it's not, you know, historically accurate, I, I can sniff a historical accuracy. I think as long as it kind of captures, I guess, the vibe is kind of what you're looking <laughs> for with these things. You want to know, you want to get the sense of who he is as a character. I think that's just as valuable. So I'm hoping to see a lot more Alexander media in the future. I hope Oliver Stone didn't kill off any attempt of a, <laughs> it's really surprising there isn't more. I've got yeah. to say, like mm -hmm. I find it really surprising that there is that there haven't been more movies, that there haven't been more. I don't like. I don't know what, but, but that you'd think he's such. It's not maybe like he's too big a figure and too huge a story to to feel tackleable. But like it is surprising to me that there's not more about him on screen. Yeah, yeah. I think I think again, yeah, it's just because he's such a such a big figure and again because the 2004 film was so poorly received i think it's right. got it's got one star on rotten tomatoes right <laughs> yeah that, that not, does tend to chill these things and, yeah, I mean, and because not the, not the rotten tomatoes imagining the window, but yeah imagining telling that story probably does feel like a very like who but oliver stone who but an epic you know a big budget tv show like a lot a la rome or a la spartacus that would dealt with the the life of Alexander feels like it it could go places. So so if you're listening and you have the power to make <laughs> such things, do 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 so. And and you can always talk to Meg if you want a, yeah, please, please <laughs> a specialist me. advisor. Please find me as your historical advisor because I have so many <laughs> <laughs> so many thoughts. <laughs> about how how we should render on screen i say to i say to my brother who's who's a film studies person i say if you become a director and we we win the lottery not impossible we're gonna we're gonna make our own <laughs> <laughs> you gotta have you know have goals in life <laughs> seems yeah. perfectly reasonable and just, you know because people sort of say oh who would you cast as alexander I'm like i don't know but i do know that i would bring back colin farrell to be philip the second Oh, that'd be so good. <laughs> because now you look at Colin Farrell, he's kind of a matured actor, and now he's got the yeah. beard, and I think, yeah, that could be a Philip the Second as a nice little callback. But from what I hear about how Colin Farrell found the filming process and the reaction, I don't think he'd be on board anytime soon. <laughs> <But> <laughs> if, if he hears this... <laughs> give me <a> call. <laughs> Colin, if you're listening, <laughs> we have a deal. <laughs> I've got an idea for you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I think on that note, uh, we should probably <laughs> wrap it up. I mean, we could talk about all of this, a million more things we could talk about, I'm sure. But I think maybe we can leave it there for now. So thank you so much. This has been a really fun conversation about a fun, well, fun slash horrible <laughs> <laughs> topic. Yes. <laughs> Do you want to let people know how, if they want to continue this discussion and or tap you as historical advisor on an upcoming project, how they can reach you or find you? <laughs> uh, I'm I'm mostly active on, on, on Twitter. That's kind of where I do like, I post like little mm -hmm. threads of information, just like kind of bite-sized research chunks. Um, so you can mm -hmm. find me on Twitter at Agamegnon, which is <laughs> supposed to be a pun on Agamegnon and my, met and my name, but I... <laughs> fudged it by one letter but if you find <laughs> that, my dms are always open for discussions about alexander if there's anything um interesting that i sort of post i kind of tend to round up some of my like research in like sort of accessible little tweet formats mm -hmm. 
So no, that's where that's where I encountered. That's where we know you from. That's why we're having this conversation. So yeah. I'll put your twi- uh, Twitter handle in the in the show notes for sure. Great. Is there anything else? Any upcoming projects? Um, to- well, yeah, just just working on on some things. I'm kind of a, in the process of applying for for PhDs at the moment. It's a very difficult time right. in, in the best of times. So I'm kind of doing independent research while I'm you know just trying mm-hmm. to survive in this pandemic. So I'm sort of an independent <laughs> researcher, just my own little bits and pieces. So mm-hmm. nothing more coming at the, at, at the moment, but I'm hoping that on the horizon I'll be able to put some of these ideas out. But I'm hoping to get some of my like previous research essays, my dissertation, if it's not going to be chopped up for publication submissions, hopefully. I want to try and get that online, sort of a more long-form format. Right, right. But anything about that will probably be announced on, on Twitter, so... <laughs> Perfect. Well, then everyone go follow Meg there. And then you will know any important breaking news in the Alexander world. (laughs) Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's been brilliant. I'm so glad to hear a bit more about the Roman side of Alexander and definitely glad to know more about the medieval. (laughs) Yeah, where things just go right off the rails (laughs) in a lovely way. All right. Thanks. Thanks. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. Keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.